Welcome, guys. Uh, my name is Alex. Hope you everybody's having a good morning. It's been uh, definitely been busy. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, communicating anonymously uh, via email, and I, I wanted to keep. So I did this talk two years ago, and uh, I kind of ended up going very deep into the technical details of some of the protocols and stuff that that uh, we can use on the back end. And I wanted this year's talk to kind of be a little bit more introductory. Uh, and take a step back, and what I noticed when I was talking to a lot of people is people had different definitions of what anonymity was, or they didn't understand exactly what they were trying to protect themselves from. So uh, I kind of uh, am going to break this talk up into two parts. The first part's going to be uh, just a general discussion of what anonymity is and what it is that we're trying to achieve. Uh, and then on the second half, I'll, I'll cover some of the approaches that we have uh, without going too deep into the technical details, but I'll give you enough resources that if you're interested, you'll be able to dive in. Uh, but my goal uh, is to make sure that everybody kind of has a good foundation of what it is that we, we should be trying to accomplish uh, in the way that we communicate. So please ask lots of questions if there's anything you don't understand. Uh, I, I definitely hope to make this kind of an organic session. All right, so let's just dive right in. What is anonymity? All right, so the colloquial use of anonymous, uh, as uh, described by Wikipedia, is uh, it's basically where a person's name is unknown, right? So if somebody doesn't know uh, the source of some information, uh, you can say that that source is anonymous. Okay, so that's just a very basic definition. Uh, the other part of that is that anonymity is seen as a technique or a way of realizing certain other values. So anonymity, just for anonymity's sake, is, is uh, not doesn't accomplish much uh, unless uh, we need it in order to gain privacy or liberty, right? If those two things are not things that we're looking for, anonymity may not be worth our time, right? So uh, anonymity is not always a positive or a benefit unless it helps you in some way. Okay? And generally those two things uh, where, where people choose to seek anonymity are either they want to protect themselves from uh, exposing or from being the source of some information or they just want to be at liberty to discuss topics uh, that they might not otherwise be at liberty to discuss. Okay, so some examples to kind of think about. Um, so an important example of anonymity, uh, not only being protected but in, enforced by law here in the U.S. is the uh, vote in free elections. Right, so when we vote, it's very important that we are able to do so anonymously uh, for a variety of reasons, right? So that we, we aren't coerced, uh, so that there's no political retribution after the fact. And so in the U.S., uh, it's very important that we maintain anonymity uh, when we cast our vote um, for a variety of those reasons, right? And when you go into a ballot box, right, there's always a little curtain that goes around you uh, so that the, nobody can see what you marked on the ballot. All right, um, and I, be I believe it's been a while since I, I've done it that way. Usually I do by mail, but um, uh, I believe there's no identifying information on the ballot itself. So once you receive the ballot, right, uh, once you cast the ballot, there's no way of linking that ballot back to you uh, directly, right? So we have an anonymous ballot, so it's a very useful thing for anonymity uh, in that in that kind of situation. Um, you, you can see the the inverse of that in a country like uh, I remember when Iraq uh, was was still led by Saddam Hussein, right? They would have uh, people come out and vote, but he would get 99% of the vote. And regardless of how popular you are, you know, I mean, you could be uh, Barney the dinosaur. You're still not probably going to get 99% of the vote uh, just from a statistical point of view, right? There's always a margin of error. And so in that situation, it was voting that was done uh, not anonymously, and people voted a certain way because they were worried about potentially retribution, and, or we could make that case, I think, in that situation. And so their anonymity is a very valuable tool uh, in order to protect a free society. Uh, so there's also other situations where uh, you might want to withhold your identity. For example, whistleblowing, right? So this isn't necessarily a, and this is kind of a hot topic right now. Uh, a lot of larger corporations don't like the idea of whistleblowing. Uh, and in fact, they're trying to pass some legislation to prevent people from being able to, to whistleblow and expose their secrets, um, for better or for worse. Um, but without taking a position on that, it, it is, it, it's, it, whistleblowing becomes much more difficult um, because there's a lot more at stake for the person that's doing it uh, if they don't have access to any kind of uh, anonymity tools, right? And so you can make the argument that if folks are not allowed to whistleblow, uh, people with who, who have a disproportionate amount of power uh, in, in our society would be able to kind of hang on to that even if they're not using it appropriately, right? 
again, I don't want to get into that discussion other than to say that whistleblowing would not be possible without the use of anonymity um, a lot of times, and I think it would reduce the amount of whistleblowing that happens. Um, another reason you might want anonymity is if you want to break the law, right? So why would we want to break the law? Anybody want to maybe shout out here? Anybody have an idea? I, I get a lot of nervous, nervous laughing. Yes, why would I want to break the law? You want to break the law because you think the law is wrong. Correct. Yeah, so there, there have been a lot of, uh, if you read a lot of history, you'll notice that something that happens over and over again in history is people break, break laws. Uh, in fact, there were a lot of laws broken uh, in, um, in the Seattle region. There were a lot of people that used to smoke marijuana uh, in the, you know, before it was legal. And so they were breaking the law. Um, and they were coordinating the ability to, to smoke marijuana. Uh, they tried to do it covertly or anonymously so that they wouldn't, wouldn't be apprehended, but they could still access something that they viewed as a medicine to themselves, right? And again, I don't want to get into the merits of whether that's right or wrong, but it's interesting because that law has now changed. And so people who are doing the same thing now that we're doing back then are no longer being punished. But in order for them to be able to do that thing which they felt was right for themselves, um, when that was against the law, they needed the help of anonymity, otherwise they could risk uh, going to jail. Okay. So again, uh, the, the point here is tool, uh, anonymity is a tool. Uh, regardless of how you feel about the, the particular issue, it is a very useful tool if you find yourself in that situation. And uh, lastly, I mean, there, there's uh, also charity, right? A lot of people want to be able to donate to various causes without being um, uh, associated with that cause directly. Uh, the, the, probably the most famous one in our kind of tech community is, uh, oh, what was his name? The guy from Mozilla. Anybody want to help me out? Uh, CEO of Mozilla. Brendan Knight. Brendan Knight, right? So he donated to a, uh, an organization that I think uh, was against gay marriage. Again, not taking a position either way, but, uh, because that was public, or he was linked to that donation, um, he lost his job at Mozilla, right? So again, there's a lot of debate whether that's right or wrong or how that should be, but it may be that you want to be able to support certain organizations without being linked to those organizations. And if that's, that's your goal, anonymity is something that you're gonna, gonna want, right? And again, it all goes back to the idea of should there be a way for people to associate without uh, other people knowing about it? And my, my argument is that I think for a free society, it, it's important because anonymity will foster more dialogue rather than less. Um, and it will allow people to communicate uh, in situations where um, free and open discussion is stifled. And so I, th I think there's a case to be made uh, for anonymity and all of its particular uh, scenarios. Any questions about any of that before I move on? Thoughts? All right, so let's get into some more, more of the technical details about anonymity. Um, so when we talk about anonymity, uh, we're always talking about a set of things, right? Um, so in mathematics, for example, uh, in a reference to an arbitrary element, um, such as a human, an object, or a computer within a well-defined set, that's what's called the anonymity set. Um, so the anonymity of that element refers to the property of that element of not being identifiable within the set. If it is not identifiable, then the element is set to be anonymous, right? So if we have a set, uh, let's say, uh, that looks like this, just a bunch of ones, right? Is there any difference between any one of these ones? Can I tell you which particular one I'm talking about within that set? Right. Now, maybe they're ordered. It, now, if they're ordered, then I could. I could tell you the first one, or the second one, or the third one, right? But if they're not ordered, if they're just in an unordered set, then I have no way of referring to them. But the anonymity of any one of these digits is within the set. Again, if we do something like this, then uh, those digits become less anonymous, right? So if I talk about the two, you know exactly which two I'm talking about. Whereas before, if I was talking about the one, you didn't know which one I was talking about. Okay, so whenever we think about anonymity, we're not thinking about a global space, we're thinking about a set of things, right? So when we're talking, usually, like when we're colloquially talking about people who don't have a name, we're talking about all people who might have names, right? So the 7.5 billion of us, right? So if we're just trying to select a, a human out of the population of all humans. Uh, and again, anonymity can apply to things other than human beings, right? To objects, computers. Uh, we all name our computers, right? So that, that's also an important part as, as uh, people who are interested in Linux. Uh, one of the things that we often try to do is obscure the uh, identity of our machine, whether it's through the MAC address on the network that it's participating in, 
um, or you know the Wi-Fi positioning uh, that gets done using GPS to, to figure out where in the geospatial sense uh, a particular device is at. So things like that uh, are also of great concern. Right? So anonymity has this uh, technical definition to it as well that we can kind of drill down into. And so to that second point there, we, want, we, should be, or we would like to be able to express anonymity in terms of degrees, the degree of anonymity. So something can be more or less anonymous, right? Like something can be more or less hot. Um, so there's two papers that, that put forth the idea of using entropy as the basis for formally measuring anonymity, and I cite them there. Uh, they're, they're available in the references section later. I, I do recommend checking those out if you're interested in that sort of thing. Uh, but just the gist of it, it kind of comes back to this idea of uh, being able to identify something uniquely, right? So let's think about this for a second. So let, let's, we're going to get there in kind of a roundabout way, so bear with me. Uh, we're all, uh, is everybody familiar here with password strength checkers, right? Yeah, okay, good. Lots of nods. So those, uh, with a password, you actually want the opposite. You want a very unique password, right? You don't want a password that everybody has. You want a password that only you have, right? So you want an uniquely identifying strength. And so oftentimes, you'll get, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you'll get uh, requests. You'll go to some crappy web page, and they'll, they'll ask you to create a username and password. And you're like, oh, man, all right, you're putting something dumb. And they're like, no, we need, we need you to use eight characters. All right, and what else? Uh, I don't know, maybe symbols. And I don't know, and, and some emojis, whatever it is that they use now, right? So uh, you're like, OK, well, so you need eight characters. So let's think about the, the strength of that password. Right, or how unique it is. The way that we determine how unique it is is we talk about bits of entropy. Okay, bits of entropy. Is everybody familiar with uh, binary? Somewhat. Okay, so binary is just a zero and one. It's it's a base two counting system, and so when we're talking about bits of entropy, we're trying to count in base two um, how likely or how 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 many possibilities there are of something. Right, in this case. So here what we want to know is how many possible passwords are available in the set of all passwords that we can generate of eight uh, digits and numbers, right? So let's say we're, we're starting with just lowercase digits, or sorry, lowercase numbers and digits. So how many lowercase letters do we have access to? Let's keep them English. 26, 26 right? So we get 26 um, letters and then uh, how many digits do we have? 10 digits, right? Zero through nine. So that gives us 36. Uh, possible characters that we can put in each one of these positions, right? Okay, so if we can put 36 here and 36 here and 36 here, um, the way that we calculate how many uh, possible permutations there are of this is we take that base number and we take it to the exponent of how many places we have. So in this case, it'd be 36 to the eighth because we have eight places, right? And the easy way to see that is if you have something like uh, two positions and you can have only digits, right? So that's 10. And then you're going to have 10 to the exponent based on how many places you have. And that's really easy to see because if you just have one place, it's to the one, right? So you can have 10 numbers if you have one digit. If you have two digits, how many numbers can you have? 100. Up to 100, right? 0 to 99. And so the mathematical equivalent of that is going to be 10 to the uh, power of 2, right? And so on. And so for 1,000, same thing, and on and on. So that, that works with base 10. And here we're working with base 2. Or sorry, here we're working with base 36 to the 8 because we have 36 possible uh, characters that we can use. Okay, so what, what's my point with all of this? <laughs> At this point, everybody's like, all right, so what, what's the deal here? So uh, the total number of unique passwords that we can have is 36 to the 8, which I can't do that math in my head. But um, th that's some, some amount, right? And we want a unique password within that set. And so... If we remove one of these characters, or better yet, let's say, uh, let's say that uh, the administrator decides, well, that's not enough. Whatever that number is, is too small, right? Computers have gotten a lot faster. Uh, if somebody gets the hash of that, they try to crack that. They're, they're, it, it's too weak of a password. Let's add another bit of entropy, okay? So in this case, a bit is actually 36 uh, values. So if we add another bit of entropy, right? Now, we go from 36 to the 8 to what? 36 to the 9 possibilities, right? So there's a lot more unique passwords that are possible. 
So if I wanted to try the space of all possible, possible passwords as a hacker, I would have to do a lot more work um, if there are more characters, right? The other thing we could do is, so we can modify the exponent, what else could we modify? The, the base, yeah, exactly, the, the, the base here uh, number. So we could say, okay, instead of just having lowercase uh, number, uh, letters and numbers, let's also add in uh, 20 symbols, right? Uh, so now we have 46, or sorry, 56 possible characters, right? And so we can we can change that number around either by adding more types of characters or adding the amount of uh, spaces that we have uh, for those characters. Okay. So what so what we want to get out of this whole discussion is that as we increase um, the amount of spaces or the amount of values within that space, we're increasing the entropy of the uh, pool of uh, possibilities, right? In other words, there are more possibilities within that set. So hopefully everybody's okay with that part. If not, let me know. So now we're gonna take it and we're gonna flip it on its head. So what we want with anonymity is we want the opposite of uniqueness, right? We want to blend in. We want everybody basically to have the same password, right? So if everybody has the same password, you have no idea uh, when somebody types in a password who they are. Versus, it, versus if somebody types in their unique password, you know exactly who they are, right? And so for anonymity, the way we get to that is we flip this on its head and you want to reduce the amount of entropy that you expose to whoever your adversary is, right? So for example, in this room, right now there's a pretty decent mix of men to women, right? So if I said that the person that I'm thinking about is a man, you would, you, would be, you would be able to eliminate half of the people in the room, roughly, in trying to figure out who it is I'm talking about. But you would still be left with that pool of 50% uh, of the room, right? It doesn't tell you enough. And so you would need to discover more uh, about that person's uh, kind of uh, entropy uh, in order to, to get more specific about uh, who they are. So if I said uh, it's a man and the man is wearing uh, sneakers, Right, so now again, we, we've narrowed down uh, the level of anonymity of that person, right? And so if we keep adding on uh, characteristics, eventually we'll get to the point where we have a unique set of characteristics that identifies that individual, and that individual is no longer anonymous, right? So just like when we added more places in the password in order to make it more unique, uh, as we add more information uh, or more characteristics, uh, it narrows the set of people that share that characteristics, and so we reduce the anonymity pool. Okay? And so the, the gist of all this is that anonymity is not just about hiding, but it's also about uh, having deniability. So if you're discovered, you want... Oh. Hello? Oh, I think it's just the... Uh, it, it'll come back in a second. So it's not just about hiding. It's also that if you're discovered, you should be able to say, well... Uh, I'm actually very similar or almost exactly like this other person, so there's no way that you can say that it was me uh, because there's no uniquely identifying characteristics about who I am, right? We were both wearing sneakers, we were both wearing sunglasses, we were both wearing a t-shirt, so how do you know who it was? Right. Kind of makes me think, I don't, I don't remember which movie it was from, but there was uh, some movie where there's these uh, android robots, right? And uh, they both, or one's a human and one's the android replica. And uh, you have to shoot one of them, and they're both telling you like, "No, I'm the real, I'm the real person. I'm not the the robot, right?" And so how, that that's anonymity. Is you want to get to that point where the person who's holding the gun can't tell which person they need to shoot. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, any questions about any of that? I know that was a little bit technical, but hopefully, uh, the the gist of all of this is understanding that anonymity is not just a uh, discrete thing. It, it's a continuum, right? So there's degrees of anonymity. So you can be, you're, you're anonymous based on the pool of people that you're in that share your characteristics. So you know when people put on those Guy Fox masks and they go out to protest and they're like, oh, I'm anonymous, right? Well, you're only anonymous within the pool of everybody who's wearing a Guy Fox mask, right? So <laughs> if I go on Amazon and I see who ordered those Guy Fox masks, <laughs> You're within that, whoever ordered those Guy Fox masks are now, that, that pool is actually pretty small. So you're not that anonymous. You're, you're somewhat anonymous, but not that anonymous, right? And so when we, when we talk about anonymity, we shouldn't talk about anonymity in the absolute. We should talk about it in terms of degrees of anonymity. How, how, how many degrees of anonymity do you actually have here? And how big is your, your uh, set of 
other things that, that you want to be compared to in that pool. All right, so now to the, to the main part of the talk. So the, the email, and what, what does email offer us as far as anonymity? Right? And the answer is not much. It's actually, email is terrible for anonymity, which is a shame because we use email for a lot of our communications, right? And uh, that creates some issues. Uh, so again, like talking about the, the freedom stuff, let's say you're writing emails and you're like, oh man, I hate Trump, or oh man, I hate Hillary, right? And I'm sure everybody's wrote some emails about that. And then uh, the person comes into power and all of a sudden they become a dictator. And then they go back through all the email logs and they go, okay, who said they didn't like me, right? That kind of sucks because now they can pinpoint exactly who didn't like who based on being able to uh, filter through all of this email, right? And so the issues with email anonymity come from three places, right? Uh, number one is uh, email is centralized in practice. So email is supposed to be a distributed system, and it is by and large, right? Anybody can run an email server. Uh, actually, just out of curiosity, who runs an email server? Oh, this is a Linux fest. I wanted to see more hands. <laughs> Sad face. All right. That's all right. So work on it. Everybody should, uh, by next week, homework for everybody, make sure you run a, your own email server. Uh, but so in practice, look, we, we all have things to do, and it's not that big a deal, and we'll talk about all the reasons why. But Email ends up being centralized in practice, right? We all either have a Gmail account, Hotmail, or whatever it is you use these days, right? Um, at this point, like an AOL account would be kind of kind of retro and cool. Anybody still have an AOL account? No. All right. All right. Um, all right. So email ends up being centralized in practice, and why is that a bad thing? Well, if email is centralized, it means whoever it's centralized around has access to a lot of information that we may not want them to have access to. Right, and again, for, for reasons that we talked about earlier. There's, there's a lot of reasons why we might want to stay anonymous. Um, the other problem with email is it's plain text by default. And this isn't just the Google trying to harvest all the ad data, data that it can kind of thing. But I mean, just even if you run your own mail server, it's a good, there's a good chance you're just sending email back and forth uh, in plain text, right? And, and this becomes an issue because what happens to your email when you send it across the network? Are, are you and your receiver the only people looking at that email? No, if you know it, so if, if you're familiar with routing at all, right, it gets routed to a lot of different nodes and places. And so anybody that gets to see that email move around, if it's in plain text, they can read that email and they know exactly what source IP it's coming from, right? So that, that becomes an issue for anonymity because now your email can be identified by somebody else and it can be linked back to you, all right? And then uh, finally, forgery is possible with email, which, which it's not, a, it's actually kind of a good thing for anonymity, right? Because if we forge who we are as, our, as a sender, maybe that makes us a little bit more anonymous. But where it's an issue for anonymity is it means somebody can forge an email in your name, right? And now link you to something you may not want to be linked with, right? So that, that kind of has an inverse uh, problem for us in terms of anonymity. It kind of turns anonymity against us. Uh, so all those three things create uh, anonymity issues within email. Yep. It does. So yes. Yeah, so it's 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 a double-edged sword when it comes to email because the forgery uh, comes without any sort. It, it, it helps a little bit with anonymity, but at the cost of also allowing people to use it maliciously. So yes, the answer to that is yes. Hackers will often forge headers for real email addresses Correct. so that when you go to complain to the address, yeah. it gets sent to somebody else. I use to get hit by those all the time. Yep. Exactly. Yep. And, and so it is a slight benefit for anonymity, but uh, the downsides are pretty large. And so we actually want to avoid forgery as a way of achieving anonymity. Um, so that, that is still, that, that's a big problem with email. So uh, let's put some Band-Aids on it, right? Because that's what we do. When we have software that doesn't work, we just apply some Band-Aids. Um, so, okay, so it's in plain text. No problem. I got GPG for encryption, right? I'll just encrypt my email. Uh, now nobody, even if it, somebody picks it up along the way, it's encrypted, they can't read it, so who cares, right? Let them look at the GPG scrambled code all they want. Um, sure, it may be centralized, and maybe most people are using Gmail, but hey, I can still run my own email server, right? Not a problem, we'll decentralize it by all running our own email servers. You guys promised me so. Um, <laughs> and then for forgery, hey, let's, let's just get clever. We'll create uh, SPF, sender ID, DKI, DKIM, whatever alphabet soup, uh, whatever company is trying to pitch their uh, way to avoid forgery. Uh, these days, uh, so we'll, we'll just uh, we'll wrap some stuff around it, and we'll uh, we'll help um, people identify the real uh, source of an email, right? So these are all potential solutions. So let's let's take a look at them. Uh, starting with GPG, uh, in 1997, uh, hopefully it's not too far back. <laughs> although that's getting that's what two decades now, right? Yeah, 
1977, at the dawn of the internet's potential, the working hypothesis for privacy enhancing technology was simple. Okay. Simple premise. We develop really flexible tool, power tools for ourselves and teach everyone to be like us. Right? That's what Linux Fest is all about. Uh, everybody will be sending messages to each other. We just need to understand the basic principles of cryptography. And man, we are all secure. Sounds great. 90s were a good optimistic time. I was excited about the future, right? And I dreamed of a world where everyone would install GPG. And now I'm still excited about the future, but now I dream of a world where I can uninstall it. Okay, this is Moxie Marlin Spike. Does anybody know what he created? Recently, he's created a lot of things. Signal. How many of you guys use Signal? Okay, so this is the guy that created Signal, one of the more popular uh, tools for communicating, uh, not necessarily anonymously, but at least uh, secretly. Uh, he's telling us basically that GPG is a pile of junk. Okay. Or more specifically, I shouldn't misquote him because I don't, I don't want to be like all the uh, news networks. What, what he's actually getting at is that GPG is built for a very technical purpose, right? And it's not very useful as a user. Uh, it doesn't have a very good user interface in order to allow people to use it effectively, right? So while GPG is very powerful and it's an amazing piece of software, don't get him or me wrong. I, I hope GPG doesn't go anywhere. It's, it's, it's a very great piece of software. Most people, even technically experienced people, don't bother using it because it has such a bad user experience. Okay, and that's what Moxie was trying to address, and that's why he wrote Signal as a, as a way of encouraging people to use encryption without actually having to understand uh, all of the technical details. Okay, the other problem. Um, so we talked about uh, all these different things that we can use to uh, stifle forgery like this. I mean, you can't see this. this is a terrible graphic, but it says this came from PayPal, intl.paypal.com, which is, um, I think there might be a Unicode character in there or something like that. But whatever it is, it, it's very easy to spam and fish, and uh, everybody's probably had a spam email or a phishing email uh, come through to them. So uh, a lot of the providers got together, and they have a lot of different ways of trying to avoid forgeries. Uh, but although their use is increasing, estimates vary widely as to what percentage of emails have no form of domain authentication. Okay, so from 8.6 to almost half. Uh, but effectively, uh, but to effectively stop forged emails being delivered, uh, receiving uh, mail systems also need to be configured to check the authentication. Right. So not only is it enough that the forger uh, that that we authenticate our emails using these schemes, it's also important that whoever we're sending them to is able to figure out how to check that authentication. Right? And with so many different ways of doing it, and with so many different types of mail servers running, uh, it's a very difficult problem to solve. Right? If you send an email to somebody, to your friend in France, uh, whatever French version of Google they're running on may not be accepting the same type of uh, forgery prevention mechanism as what you're using. Right? And so this relies on everybody coordinating globally, which is uh, equal to about 8.6 to 50%. And we probably won't go too much past that threshold if history is any judge. Okay, so again, GPG is not working for us. Uh, email authentication is not working for us. So these Band-Aids are not working. And ultimately, uh, email isn't a very good system for secure communications, period. Okay, you're wholly dependent on other people doing the right thing and sending you properly encrypted email. In other words, it doesn't matter how good your security is, if the person you're communicating with has any problem or has any issues with their security setup, you're just as screwed. <laughs> okay. So it becomes, uh, becomes an untenable system uh, very, very quickly. And th there's not much we can do. All, all the things that we try to do to fix email are not really solving the problem. They're just adding on to the ball of stuff. More importantly, there's an even scarier issue. Let's say we solve all of those problems. Let's say we figure out some magical cure, cures for those three issues. We still have this issue in email that does not go away, right? So this is uh, Joe Biden, our, our ex-vice president. Um, I don't have to listen to your phone calls to know what you're doing, okay? Important, content doesn't matter. If I know every single phone call that you made, I am able to determine every single person that you talk to. I can get a pattern about your life that is very, very intrusive. Okay. We all love Joe. He's such a great guy. So this is what Edward Snowden was talking about as being one of the biggest problems of communication in the US, and that is metadata collection. Okay? The NSA doesn't care what you're talking about. All they care is who you're talking to. Okay? And what's great for them is email has no way of solving this problem. 
right? And that's why, if I want to send an email to something, what's the first thing I need to do? Address. The address. A uniquely identifiable address. And it's even better, it doesn't even just give you a, a random name, it gives you a domain that links to a what? A DNS record that has what? Contact information. Fantastic. <laughs> My job is easy if I'm the NSA, and I like to keep it that way. And so would Joe. He's got other things on his mind. All right, let's solve this problem. All right, we're techies. We, uh, we, we can get around this. Uh, if the problem is the protocol, we can fix it. Uh, so there's a white paper published by Jonathan Warren, uh, creating, I'll spare you the details, but uh, creating a trustless, decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer protocol designed to mask non-content data like the sender and receiver of messages. Interesting. So how does this system propose to solve our problems? Well, yes, yeah, exactly, yeah. So there's, there's kind of this new idea of using uh, cryptography uh, and uh, decentralized peer-to-peer -peer networking in order to achieve some properties that traditional uh, networking systems like email and, um, uh, uh, like, uh, and, and other networking protocols fail to achieve. So how, how does BitMessage uh, work against forgery, right? So uh, what BitMessage does is it create, users exchange a hash of a public key that also functions as the user's address, okay? So we're not gonna use domain names and, and email addresses. We're gonna use a hash of a public key, okay? That's a lot harder to associate with anything because you can create how many of those? As many as you want, as many as you have processing power to create. Um, so we're gonna take that public private key and hopefully I'm, I'm kind of glossing over, is anybody not familiar with public private key cryptography? Just in, in, not in the technical details, just how it works basically, right? So just really quickly, it's a public private key situation is where you have one very secure key and you split it into two, right? And it has a unique mathematical property that if you use the first half of the key uh, to write a message and encrypt it using that first half, it can only be decrypted by the second half or the private portion. Okay? So you can encode something using half of that key that's public, and the only person that can decode it is the person that has the other half of it. Okay? So that, that's really great because now I could publish my public key, anybody can encrypt information, and the only way it can be decrypted is by me. Okay? Not even the person that used my public key to encrypt it can decrypt it. So that's just kind of, that's public, public, public private key cryptography in five seconds, which <laughs> does not do it any justice at all. But hopefully that gives you an idea of where we're going with this. So we take that public key, which we can publish, and we encode it with base 58. In other words, we just kind of compress it into this uh, string of, of letters and digits. Um, so we kind of, uh, kind of think of it kind of like zipping up uh, the public key into this uh, shorter string. Um, and then so we end up with this address that looks like this. Right? So it's a little bit unwieldy, but uh, it's, uh, there's, there's not much entropy being exposed there. Right, so can we tell anything about the person that generated this address, just from this address alone? Hopefully not, right? I mean, it's just a random number. I could have picked any random number out of a hat. Guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> people used to say that about people who had email addresses. So let, let, let's hope let's hope that it changes and this becomes commonplace, right? So that's okay. It's good to be a geek because you get the cool stuff first. <laughs> right? All right. Um, so uh, this address format is superior to email and then it guarantees the message. Uh, oh, right, so the other property of this address is not only that it's uh, hard to tell where it came from, it also, because it's using public private key, guarantees that the sender of the message cannot be spoofed. And why is that? Why do we know that the sender of the message cannot be spoofed? Because the key relation. Exactly, so the key that they use, they can sign the message using their key, and we know we can, we can using public key cryptography, verify that signature. Right? And that signature verification happens not through a central authority, but through mathematics. And who do you trust more, math or the guys who uh, create SSL certs? <laughs> oh, there we go. All right, good. They've screwed you guys enough, right? All right. All right, so, so looks like BitMessage so far has solved our forgery problem. Great. And it still allows us to know, it still allows us to, um, it, it still preserves the anonymity things uh, aspect of forgery but it gets rid of the bad parts, which is faking somebody's identity, right? So that, that's very clever. So we're, we're not losing that property, but we are getting rid of the bad property. 
All right, so how do we get these things around? We created these messages, we've, we've encoded them uh, based on that person's public key. How do, we, how do we anonymously transport it, right? Because the transport part is also kind of tricky. If I send an email to you from my account, right, I have to get it out from my IP address to out to the network, right? And who sits between me and the network? ISP. The ISP, and what can they do? That they can figure out that you're the one sending that email. Even if, even if you GPG encrypted or whatever, they still see that you're sending an email from somebody to somebody else at a specific point in time, right? And that's a lot of entropy that they gain about you. That de-anonymizes you quite a bit, even if they have no idea what you're talking about. Think Joe Biden, all right? Um, so the way that we get around this is uh, we just have all users receive all messages and send all messages, right? We're gonna expand that set of anonymity to, to everybody who's participating in the system. So now I'm sending all the emails and I'm receiving all the emails that are in, in our system. And so even if somebody can see me doing that, can they associate any particular email with me? Do I gain deniability? I do, right? So now if somebody says, hey, you sent that message, I said, yeah, I was just forwarding it for somebody else in the system, right? So I've gained deniability. Um, <clears throat> so, but then how do we get the messages we actually really want? Well, what's great is all we have to do since we're receiving all the messages, as we receive them, we just try to decrypt them. And if they decrypt, they're probably meant for us, right? Our key worked with it. So if our key matches, boom, we get our messages. So in the process of uh, sharing all the messages, we're able to pick out the messages that are for us. And does anybody know that we open those messages? No, right? So nobody has any way of linking us to that particular message. Um, so anyway, uh, bottom line here is if you send and receive all messages, there's no way to know which, if any, messages were meant for you. We've achieved an an anonymity. And, and there, uh, I did miss a certain point here. So part of the transfer mechanism kind of it mirrors what uh, Bitcoin does with the, blo uh, with the blockchain. So if anybody's familiar with that. Now, BitMessage is in no way tied to Bitcoin. It just uses some of the similar networking techniques that Bitcoin does. So if you're familiar with that, um, that's a quick way of explaining how that initial interaction works. Which Bitcoin is also seeking some form of pseudo anonymity in its, uh, in its design. All right, so now everybody is wondering, how does this thing scale? There's no way this is going to scale. Right. Um, so if all the nodes receive all the messages, it's natural to be concerned about the scalability. Okay. But what happens is, as uh, the amount of people sending messages on these uh, on using BitMessage increases, what we can do is we can self-segregate. Right. So if you're starting to get and receive too many messages and you can't handle anymore, you just move down a level in the stream. And so you tag your message and say, "Look, I'm, I'm going to uh, be downstream." So if somebody sends you a message, uh, they know to send it. To, uh, to address it to this stream that's further down. And so you can spend less resources processing all the messages in that stream. Now again, it's gonna reduce your anonymity pool somewhat, but it allows you to scale. So it lets you make the trade-off. There's always gonna be a trade-off. There's no way to do this. Uh, you get to decide how much you wanna drink from the fire hose versus uh, how much uh, you have in terms of resources of processing all the messages that come through the fire hose, right? So the bigger the fire hose, if you choose to stay at level one, you're gonna get everything, right? And that could get really big. But the nice part about it is you're very, very secure, right? So the higher you are in the stream, the more uh, deniability and the more anonymity you achieve. Uh, but if you need to, let's say your computer can no longer handle it, you can go down a stream and you can append that to your message. And so now you're processing fewer messages, um, but you're able to at least receive what you need to receive, right? And so you, you get to make the trade off of uh, level of anonymity versus ability to participate in the system. So the scalability is left up to the user uh, using this kind of uh, framework. Okay, so that's very convenient. Um, and then finally, uh, the goal of BitMessage is to make sure that, uh, that it uses a negligible amount of hard drive space and processing power. And the way that it does that is by default, and again, this is all user tweakable, by default, only two days worth of messages are stored, right? So you don't store these messages indefinitely. There's just a running window of two days. And if you, let's say, uh, log off for, for two days, what happens is there's an exponential back off uh, on the sender. So by default, it'll send a uh, message in two days. If it doesn't get a confirmation that it was received, it'll try again in four days. If it doesn't get a confirmation, it'll try again in eight days, right? So eventually, the idea is at some point, you'll log in and be able to receive that message. Quick question about that. Yep. So if you could just walk through somebody in node four hmm? is sending a message and it turns out it's somebody in node six is the receiver, how does that actually? So you encode which uh, stream you're in into your address, right? So that address that we saw earlier, 
So here you would just put a colon and then the stream that you're in. And then so when the stuff's coming through, you say, I'm only going to accept and process things that are in stream three. Yep, no problem. Great question. No, nothing's logged, so everything's up to you. So what you do well, is everything's embedded in the blockchain, right? Well, more importantly, everything's in, in this. Uh, all the information is in the address. So if you want to change streams, you have to change. You have to alert whoever's going to be sending you the uh, that you've changed which stream you're in. You so the email address. Basically. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if we think of this as the email address, then yes. So you, Correct. And so, but we want to break away from that because that's exactly the problem that we have with anonymity, right? Is if we have a single email address that we can't get away from, and we all have that, uh, there's no way for us to disassociate ourselves with that email, right? And what we want is we want to be able to disassociate ourselves from what we use to send and receive. And the idea with these addresses is they're so easy to create. You should base, uh, ideally, um, I don't want to go too deep into this, but ideally you would want to generate a new address for every message you send, right? So on every message I send with BitMessage, at the end of it is a new address that I've generated that the reply should go to. So no, I never use any two addresses, which makes it even more difficult to analyze how many messages are going back and forth between the same addresses, right? Because if we use the same address over and over and over again, that gives information to whoever's watching the network, right? Because although they know nothing else, since they're collecting all the messages, they see the quantity of messages that are being sent to that address, right? Which which could expose us in some way. You probably already said this, but does that mean you're using the same private key the whole time? Just generate no. no. No, so you have a different private and public. So anytime you generate a new key, you get a new private and public key. The good thing is, look, we don't have to memorize this stuff. We have computers that'll do this tedious work for us, right? So I can have a million addresses, and they can all be on my laptop, right? Not a problem. Let, let the computers do the hard work here. Uh, in exchange, we get um, uh, we get uh, enhanced uh, anonymity and uh, the ability to uh, authenticate who we are when we're dis uh, discussing things anonymously, right? And we'll talk about some of the issues with the system in a little bit, yes? So maybe you're going to get to this, but I'm at Linux Fest and I have all this set up in my home server, yep. and the FBI knows I'm up to no good, or mm -hmm. I'm up to good, actually, okay. and they raid my house, they grab my laptop, yep. As long as I have my laptop encrypted, I'm good, but if somehow they get through the encryption, then they have everything. Yes, correct. Yeah, and that is one of the weaknesses of the system. So yeah, well, and, and I will address the weaknesses in a minute. I just kind of want to give you guys a general gist of how this works. But yes, great point, and good. I'm glad you're thinking about the weaknesses already. Uh, any other questions or thoughts? Again, so th there's a lot to cover here. I'm trying, I just kind of want to give you guys a high level overview. We'll talk about some of the negatives, and then we can get into the, the nitty gritty if you, if you so choose. Um, so again, so the idea about this slide is, yes, there are, there, scalability is something that's well thought out. Uh, there are some issues and there are some trade-offs, uh, but the system on paper looks like it can scale to an average user uh, given some of the trade-offs. And I encourage you guys, I put a, a link in here to the white paper uh, that was published. It does a great job. It's just like the Bitcoin white paper. It's a fantastic uh, short expose on, if you've never read a white paper, this is a good place to start. Uh, it's, it's a great explanation of all the details of the system. All right, so cool. We have this awesome thing, but, and uh, as the discussion has turned, we're back to this. Uh, usability versus security, right? Do we get something we want to interact with or do we get something that gives us what we want in terms of privacy, right? And this, this is the reason security fails most of the time, right? If you make your passwords longer, they become harder to remember. So what do users do? They write them down. If you ask users to change their passwords uh, every 30 days, what do they do? They add a single character, right? So he here, here's an interesting uh, thing that uh, I learned about a couple years ago. So you know all those um, uh, password dumps that happen constantly, right? Uh, if you're not aware of them, go to haveibeenpwned.com, put in your email, and you will see all the password dumps you've been pwned in, right? Um, so the, the deal with those password dumps is a lot of them are just hashes of your password, they're not your actual password, right? But that, that's sufficient for somebody to figure out what your password is. And so when these dumps happen, administrators come in, they say, okay, look, uh, somebody stole all the hashes of your password, but you just need to change your password, and by the time they crack the hash, we'll all be safe, right? So what do users do when you tell them to do that? They go in and they add an exclamation point, or a one, right? 
And so what happens when that password uh, cracker breaks that MD5 version of that password that, that, was, uh, that was used? How, how much work do they have to do to figure out what the new password is? On average, very little. Very little, right? They just had an exclamation point. Boom, they have the new password. So again, anytime you think you're getting more security, right, users will always opt for usability. And so we can never get the whole shebang, if you will. Por que no los dos? Why? Okay? Let's, let's get it there. So let's just take our favorite email clients, which we love and work so well, and bridge them to use bit messages of transport, right? Let's get rid of that nasty, crafty, uh, crafty uh, email transport that's been around since the, what, 50s, 60s, right? And let's replace it with something like BitMessage, which is really well thought out and uses new discoveries in computer science. So here's, this is what I proposed about two years ago. This isn't unique to me, it's just it needs some work and that's why I'm hoping some of you here will get interested in the project and, and help contribute. So the idea is, look, we have this BitMessage network, which I'll, I'll demo for you guys in a bit. It has an API sitting on top of it. Awesome, everybody loves APIs, right? How many Ruby developers we got in here? Everybody's on APIs, right? Everybody and their mom has an API. My mom has an API, really. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so BitMessage has this great API that it exposes for us, right? And we can just write some scripts to work with that API to send messages back and forth, and we can link those scripts to our existing IMAP and SMTP servers, because why? They're open source, right? We can, we can hack in there and make them do what we want them to do instead of what they've been programmed to do. And then we can keep using our email clients to interact with this BitMessage network without having to uh, write new clients, if you will, right? And, our, and we, can, we can migrate our, our parents and our grandparents and, and our users uh, to this new system without them even noticing other than the issue of uh, the, the way that they address emails. But even that's solvable. So uh, if we want email over BitMessage, uh, here's what we need, and this is doable today. This was doable two years ago, so it's only gotten even easier and better since. Um, so first we start with the reference client, which I'll show in a little bit. Uh, we put it into daemon mode, so we just let it run as a service. Uh, we access its API. Uh, I've written here some starter scripts, so th these work just fine uh, as is, so you can just plug those in. And what they do is they'll take uh, messages that come in from your SMTP server and write them out to BitMessage. And then the great thing about BitMessage is when email comes in, they've thought ahead and the email is put into a mail directory stop, right? And so all you need to do is put an IMAP server on top of it and you don't even need scripts or anything fancy. You can read bit, your bit messages directly via IMAP, okay? Because it just uses a mail for format for anybody that's familiar with that. So the two of you that run mail servers. <laughs> Uh, and so here's some more details on that. Um, uh, the, if you're gonna play with this, a uh, really easy IMAP server to start with uh, is Dov, uh, Dovcot, I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, so just jump on there, do a quick config. Uh, you'll have an IMAP server ready to go. You can just layer that right on top of the BitMessage mail directory. And you're already able to use your email client just with those two steps to receive any messages that come in through BitMessage. Uh, and then it's a little bit trickier the other direction, right? Because there's SFTP servers have to have a lot of formatting and stuff going on um, under the hood, but uh, there's a, a great program called Email Relay, which can uh, act as a proxy for SMTP messages. So as messages come in, uh, Email Relay grabs them and it acts as an SMTP server, and then it can forward them to another SMTP server, which is what it was originally uh, written for. But we can hijack that behavior and uh, plug in a script that when it catches that email from your SMTP uh, session, we uh, run it through our scripts that the script pushes it out into BitMessage, right? And so now we get the other side of that. So now anything that comes in from the email via our SMTP server, we email relay back into BitMessage. And so now we have established a two-way pipe um, between our IMAP and SMTP. Basically, we did this part, right? And so we can keep using all of our desktop, mobile, internet clients, whatever we want, to access BitMessage, and this actually works pretty well. It's a little, it's a little clunky just because there's a lot of stuff stuck together with gum and, and shoestrings, but it works. And in fact, uh, as of the last few years, there's some efforts to write uh, IMAP and SMTP servers that are specifically meant to just interact with uh, BitMessage directly, which are, uh, which are a lot nicer than the, the gum and shoestring approach. But I recommend this message to start with, or th this approach to start with, because this uses the official reference client and so it's, um, it's a little bit safer, you're not relying on any third party, uh, and it gives you a little bit of exposure as to what's going on underneath, and it's always good to understand what's going on underneath, at least in a superficial way, so you have, have an idea of what that looks like. There's a question in the back. So as long as we're running our own server, 
then this all happens in house and everything leaving the house is is good. Yep. If we're doing this on AWS or anywhere else, yep. it's like basically our ISP and the FBI and everything is all over, right? Exactly. So the bottom point here, keys are stored on the server. So understand this. In order for the server to do its job, it has to be able to decrypt messages as they come in in order to figure out which messages are meant for you. So the, that is a weak point. The good news is you control it. The bad news is it's, it's out there, right? Like it, it's, it's hot, it's, it's on the network, right? You can't just hide the key uh, like you could, like if you have a Bitcoin wallet, right? You can just stash that away like in a basement somewhere nobody will ever know. With this, the keys need to be hot on the server. And that is an issue. Um, so again, so issues with this setup. Where, where do we need improvement? Uh, one is you need a server, right? And most people are not gonna run their own server. Yes, question. Yeah, um, I guess I'm having trouble visualizing the path of the message. Mm -hmm. You know, if everyone's running the BitMessage client, yep. then we don't need IMAP or Pop right. or any of those, right? SMP. Yep. So it's only for legacy clients, people that are running over the standard email. So if you, you're running BitMessage, send a message out to a standard user, yep. um, it has to run through that server. Correct. Okay. Um, so. And I was thinking originally that that server for BitMessage would be a, like a centralized server. Right. That would do all of them. Instead, right. you're saying each one of us would have our own server? You could do both. Out. You could do both, but key point is if you do it on somebody else's server, they have your private keys. Your, your diagram was basically a setup where you could actually have the one interface where you could just both do both traditional and BitMessage in Correct. one interface. Right? Yes, yes. And so the key here is uh, my mobile desktop, whatever client that I'm using on my phone, I can send email and I can send bit and receive bit messages. But so if I can you were use, just doing bit message, you don't need anything. You don't need you any of this. Exactly. Oh yeah, if you just yeah, if you just want to do bit message, uh, you can just use the, the reference client and I'll show that in a little bit. It's very easy. Yes? So kind of what he was saying, um, I'm kind of visualizing the pathing as well, because you said one of the, the big advantage of this was everyone receives a message and everyone sends a message. Correct. So if this is decentralized and I have my server at home, he has Correct. his server at home. Yep. Does that, uh, wouldn't my server need to make an initial communication to the entire node saying here's a, here's a message that needs to go out? Uh -huh. So That's wouldn't right. technically you could still basically trace that back to the initial. But remember, you're doing that for every message, not just yours. Right? It would be a lot, but a <laughs> big PCAP. Yeah, but, but they don't know which message that you're sending came from you. All they know is you're sending out messages. So, so even the, that initial message that you're sending out basically is just going to tell everyone to send a message is going to basically be the same packet. But you don't have to tell anybody. You just throw the message out there. They know, like, everybody knows to forward So it's, it's more of a relay. You basically, you yeah. send out a message and then everyone copies that and sends it out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so everybody's just throwing messages out. And you don't really, you don't even have to worry about because the address is embedded in it, right? Or, well, basically, so the address is the decryption, uh, the second half of the decryption key. So everybody's just sharing a bunch of data. And none of this data looks like anything, right? It's all encrypted. And the only people that can see the data is people, as the data is coming in, are able to decrypt and say, oh, hey, that message was from me. And grab it, right? Is that, that kind of answer your question? And, and it does. If, it, has, it pops up another question. Okay. And if everyone's sending out the messages, if you're sending to a legacy client, isn't that person receiving thousands of messages? Like, why, why isn't the email sent? Well, so that happens in the bit message daemon, right? So all the messages are stored and handled in the bit message daemon. What you're getting in the client is just the messages that were decrypted for you. So the email client is still only getting the message that was meant for it, right? So all the work of the decryption and storage happens at the bit message level. And then once it's decrypted the email, then it forwards it through IMAP, or it puts it in the IMAP mail directory, and the IMAP server picks it up and gives it to the mail client. So the mail client still only receives the messages that that it wanted. This is just your bridge into the yes. bit message. If exactly. If you wanted to keep the same interface that you've always used. Correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because the idea is, look, if we just throw a bit message out there, it, it's too technical. And I'll show you what it looks like. And nobody's going to use it. So what we need is we need to we need to merge the mermaid and the tail, right? Mm -hmm. we, we need to make it attractive. And the way that you make it attractive is by not changing anything. Uh, question. Uh, you talked about the problem of scalability. Yes. So when Yes. Uh, but is there any vector guideline or sort of threshold for the kind of segregation? It's up to the user. So if I'm running a massive server farm and I have tons of storage, I'll, I'll sit at root stream if, if I need that much anonymity. But if, I, if I'm a smaller user and I need some anonymity, but I don't have all those resources, it's a cost-benefit trade-off. I can go down to one of the lower streams, 
use less resources, still achieve anonymity, but tailored to my set of resources, right? So anonymity always has a cost. And the idea is not that we're gonna solve anonymity for free for everybody, that's impossible. What we're doing is we're giving people access to anonymity at a price, and that price is server and CPU resources. By the way, if you notice the trend in computing recently, money is a lot less useful now. CPU cycles are way more, more uh, profitable than, uh, the CPU cycles and electricity are the currency of the future, not anything we're using now, if we go down this path. A any other questions? So it sounds like uh, when you start segregating the team, then it becomes back to the idea of I people team kind of thing, so the name is, right? Well, you're not going to, so all of these are still anonymous, right? Um, but we, you're right, so it does reduce the anonymity, right? So when we talk about the entropy level, right? So if we have a password that's you know eight characters long, um, it's only so unique. And as we add characters, it becomes even better. But the problem is, as we add more characters, fewer users will actually remember the password and they'll end up opting to write it down somewhere and that invalidates, right? So once we go past a certain threshold, the security just falls apart. And so what we need to do is we need to tailor the security to the user's uh, ability to pay for that security, right? And so when we talk about passwords, what the users are paying with is their brain space, right? And most users don't have a lot of brain space. So, you know, there's, there's the sysadmins, right? So, so we can only ask them to pay so much, right? I mean, as a sysadmin, I would like to have users have 100 character passwords, but is that gonna work, right? So then we just throw the baby out with the bathwater. So what we do is we find that happy medium. And so what's happening here is if we're choosing one of the lower level nodes for our scalability, we're finding the happy medium between what the user can allocate as far as resources and number of messages they can process and store versus how much anonymity they get. So the more you can process and store, the more anonymous you appear. The less, the less anonymity. But we have to think of anonymity in terms of degrees. Just, have, just because anonymity has been reduced doesn't mean it's worthless. Right? So some anonymity is better than none. And that's what the system gives the users as an option. Right? So it's not hard coded in. The user chooses their level of scalability. Great question. Any others? All right. So, um, again, so some of the issues that we're facing is A, you need a server, but hopefully uh, at this point, does everybody have a server? Who doesn't have a server right now? Do you have a phone? Do you have a server? It, it's acting as a server right now. So everybody in this room, regardless of whether you have a box like this, right, you have a server in your pocket. <laughs> And you're all happy to see me as well. <laughs> all right. Uh, so, so the point is, uh, we don't have to think of servers in terms of uh, just these boxes that sit in data centers. Everybody can, can have a server. And that's why we talked about in scalability. Even if you have a small server, like a phone in your pocket, you can still gain some level of anonymity on that. In fact, there's a bit message client for Android, although I don't recommend running it because it will destroy your phone. But uh, it is possible, like it needs some work, right? Get in there, uh, contribute some patches. It is possible to scale that down and give you even a little bit of anonymity. Uh, if all you have is a phone, like maybe you're in Africa and all you have access to is a phone, you can still gain some semblance of anonymity. So it scales quite well in that situation. Uh, but nevertheless, it is something that you need, right? So uh, you can't, you know, with, currently with email, you can not have any piece of hardware and just go into like a kiosk somewhere and use it. So that, that is a downside versus just traditional mail setup. Uh, the other part of it is setup is not trivial. Uh, with an asterisk there, yet yeah, it's getting easier all the time. And that's why hopefully some of you will become interested and participate in the project. Um, it's really, it's great. I can't say enough great things about it. So it's an awesome way to learn about networking. It's an awesome way to meet some really cool people. And it helps you think about some of the problems that are very current in computer science. Uh, so that being said, uh, we can mitigate this by uh, maybe distributing a live distro. Right? There's a lot of distro makers here. You can make a live distro that's focused around bit message that people just pop in the CD-ROM into a spare computer. And they have a bit message system running. Um, or you can create a hosted service. Now, sure, you, people would have to trust you. right? But trusting Google versus trusting your neighbor, I'll trust my neighbor. Right? Well, hopefully. <laughs> if, you, if you trust your neighbor less than you trust Google, you've got issues. Because um, <laughs> right? Google looks at everything. So if my neighbor sees as much as Google sees, I'm in trouble. All right. Um, so, and, and there is. There's stuff popping up like this already. Uh, so there's a website called bitmessage.ch, which does uh, exactly this. Uh, let me see if I can. Um, <clears throat> so, bit. Message.ch. Can't type under pressure. 
Uh, hopefully it comes up. There we go. So here's uh, here's an enterprising entrepreneur. They came in and he built a basically the Gmail of Bit Message. Right? So he's hosting a mail gateway that you can, uh, for completely free, no advertisements, nothing, all you have to do is let him hold your keys. <laughs> but, but the point is, look, he put something up that the community can play with. Right? Not all of us right now are trying to smuggle 10 pounds of heroin or something. Right? We, we just want to play with the system and see how it works. And this is a great way of, uh, without having to set anything up, just trying it out. Right? And so this is implementing what I diagrammed earlier. Right? So you're able to use a mail client to access bitmessage.ch, but under the hood, it's using uh, the bitmessage network. Okay. So that is one way of overcoming the setup is not trivial part. Again, there's trade-offs. So in security, it's always a trade-off. You're never going to get security for nothing. Right? And so you can make trade-offs for convenience, which is nice, because then it gives us a sliding scale of how secure we want to be. And again, anytime we're talking about public, public, public private key cryptography, regardless of the system we're using, whether it's Bitcoin, bitmessage, uh, sending notes to your grandma with GPG, the, whoever holds the keys, the private keys, holds everything. So be, always ask the question, where are my private keys? And anytime you talk about these systems, where are my private keys? Always be aware of that. So that, that is the price we pay for the public-private pu public key cryptography setup. Okay, so something that's changed in the last two years that I really like. Uh, <clears throat> we can take this and we can flip it. Uh, so in, uh, instead of sending uh, bit messages using an email client, let's say we really like the bit message uh, client that we'll take a look at in a second, and we want to uh, use it to talk to some of our friends that are still on email because they didn't get the message. Right? We can do that. And so here's another uh, service that was put up. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't uh, done the architecture graph for this yet, but this is an open source project uh, that does the exact same thing. Uh, the GitHub link is there. And what it creates is it creates a, a relay gateway so you can use the BitMessage client to send out uh, emails through this uh, forwarding system. It actually ends up being more anonymous than it sounds. So let's take a look at it real quick. Uh, <clears throat> so it's called MailChuck. Let me see. And so what it does um, is here's the uh, four easy steps. Um, so you get the BitMessage client, right? You create a new address. Yeah, okay, that's all very easy and boring. And then you register an address with uh, this server MailChuck, which runs a full-fledged mail server. Okay? And you do that by sending a bit message to uh, the message uh, that you use to register with MailChuck. So you never have to touch the email, email network, right? You never have to interact with it. But you send a message registering an email address with this forwarding service. Right? And so now what you can do is anybody that sends an email to that real email address will now be forwarded back to your BitMessage address. What's nice is there's a separation because once this gets forwarded into the BitMessage network, nobody knows where it went. And so you can have an email address without being connected to it in any meaningful way using this kind of relay setup. Okay? And what's great is this is still free uh, uh, for receiving, uh, but because it is kind of a, it, it does cost uh, some resources. Uh, it does uh, require you to pay for sending emails, right? Now, so if you have to pay and you pull out your credit card, boom, there's all your anonymity out the door, right? Luckily, we have a pseudo anonymous cryptocurrency. Anybody want to shout out <laughs> what that is? So you can, uh, in conjunction with Bitcoin, you can actually pay for people to host these relay services for you without revealing your identity. Um, and so I, I recommend playing with this if you just want to receive some emails. Uh, one, one other thing I wanted to show you guys here real quick. So on the usage, I just want to show how the registering works because that's really the brilliance, right? So in order to register, what you're going to do is you're going to send a bit message to that bit message address and you're going to specify uh, which email you want, right? Like user123 at mailchuck.com. Mailchuck.com will register that address for you on your behalf with its server and then link your bit message address that you sent the message from so that prevents spoofing to that account. So now anytime an email comes to that address, it will be automatically forwarded to the address that you registered with. Okay? And it doesn't do any processing, it just passes it right along. So ideally you would want to like GPG encrypt or, or something like that to hide the contents from uh, MailChuck. So the, the price that we're paying here is we're exposing our, our connection to whoever's sending the message to that MailChuck address, and we're linking it to our BitMessage address. So there is some security compromise. But again, this gives us a lot of convenience because now we have an email address 
that can be given to people and they, they can send emails that go through to our BitMessage uh, client, right? So if you, want, if you need to have an email address but you want to stay as anonymous as possible, this is probably your best bet right now. Correct. And it's forwarding it just to that one. Well, it doesn't remove it because what this server does is it participates in the BitMessage okay. network, right? So it receives the email on your behalf and then it and participates then in the network. Yeah. So everybody will still get a copy. But again, as soon as it sends it out on the network, it becomes encrypted using your public key. Right. So even if you receive plain text email, it will by default encrypt, encrypt it to your key and send it out. That being said, be careful because that plain text email is seen by MailChuck.com. And so it would probably be a good practice to encrypt Double this, encrypt your This just emails. allows people who aren't part of the BitMessage network to send emails to BitMessage. Exactly right. That, that's a great way of putting it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So this is doing the kind of the inverse of what uh, we just uh, the other process we described, where we actually interact with BitMessage using a mail client. Yes. And does this remove that you were mentioning before about changing the the your address every time you send a, a message? This one. That yes. Yes, so, so, but you can get around that. So you can, you, there's also a deregister command. So if you wanted to be really safe, you could deregister like once a day and register a new address so you can cycle it as much as you'd like. Mm -hmm. So that's still a possibility. Great, great questions. And, uh, anything else before, I think we're getting close here. Uh, demo, yeah, okay, so references are at the end. Uh, let's take a look at what this thing actually looks like. So uh, in order to grab it, uh, it's, uh, if you're running on Linux, the best way is to go to their GitHub repo. So if we do, if we type GitHub and then BitMessage, that will take us right to the project. Okay, so there's the reference uh, client. Uh, good news is it's written in Python, so should be very accessible to a lot of people. I know a lot of people love Python, so uh, very easy to read the code. It's it's well documented. Uh, references are fantastic. I highly recommend the white paper, even if you want nothing to do with this, just to see how good technical writing is done. Um, so there it is. All you have to do is clone the Git repo. Hopefully I'm talking to an audience that knows what that means. Um, so clone the Git repo, and then uh, you may need a couple dependencies. Just use pip to grab them. Uh, the dependencies are listed in the wiki. Uh, so if you click on the wiki tab, it'll take you to the official wiki. Da -da 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 -da. All right, uh, on here, and then there's a really good um, guide here for, it's called compiling instructions, but it's actually just good for, for general setup. And it's pretty simple. So a bunch of distros already support it, so there's a bunch of documentation for your particular distro. Um, there's even a Windows build. We want everybody, we're, we're a welcoming community. Um, but the way that I prefer to run it, in case you want to be distro agnostic, is again, just clone the repo right here. And then you can run BitMessage. And usually it'll probably spit out a, an error saying, hey, you're missing some one of the dependencies. And if you are, just run uh, pip.install whatever dependency you're missing. So that, that'll get you where you need to be. Um, and here's what it looks like when it's running. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know how to zoom that in. Let me try. Let me see if I can reduce my resolution here. That might help. Um, 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 um. So let's see. We'll try to shrink it to that. It's, it kind of just shrinks the thing. Let me try uh, 1024 by 768. See if that does any better. Still, I haven't found a good presentation tool that will zoom well. So if anybody's working on, on projects, that might be kind of cool. OK, there we go. That's a little bit better, right? Uh, all right. So here's what the client looks like. You guys can see all my addresses and stuff. Oh, no, I've, I've been busted. Um, so uh, here's a couple of things. So I've set up a MailChuck account. Uh, if anybody wants to just send me an email there, uh, give that a shot and we'll see if, if anything pops up. Um, and then if you have a, a bit message or if you get this up and running, feel free to send me uh, a, a test message here. Uh, I will try to respond. Oh, sorry, the, the slides are all messed up. But um, the, the, the email's on the slides. Uh, but it's pretty straightforward. It tries to mimic an email client, right? Uh, it has. Uh, the other nice thing you can do is you can do subscriptions. You can't see the tab on there. But uh, the other thing that allows, since all the messages are going out to everybody, you can, it's also a great way to set up an anonymous kind of newsletter. right? So you can publish a message uh, on a particular key, sign it, and not encrypt it. So what that does is it basically says, hey, I published this thing. You know that it was published from this address, and everybody can see it. 
So it acts as a great way to disseminate information publicly while remaining anonymous, right? And still maintaining the authenticity of that message. And right? so let's say we build a resistance group, a Linux Fest resistance group. We're gonna want march on Redmond, right? And we wanna, con uh, we wanna communicate all of our plans. <laughs> we wanna communicate all of our plans, but we don't want the guys at Microsoft figuring it out. Is that a sign that I'm running out of time? No, no okay. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, and uh, what we want to do is we, we want to be able to read that without having to, to tell every group member what the key is, right? So we don't have, we, I don't want to have to send a message to every one of those people in the group. I can just broadcast that message with my signature, and then you guys will know what time we need to march on Redmond. So, very useful. Um, pop, pop. What time? <laughs> check, check bit message. Uh, so here's the network tab. Uh, you can see uh, by default you get eight connections. It's, it's pretty good about giving you some good debug. Um, there really isn't that much going on, so don't be afraid to run this. It's not going to swamp your computer. It, it stays pretty reasonable. I haven't had it go over like a couple hundred megabytes at most currently uh, in, its, in its current state. And again, because of that two-day moving window, you'd be surprised how many or how few messages actually end up on your system. Um, the other part that I didn't talk about, there's a built-in spam uh, prevention mechanism, and it, it hijacks the idea that Bitcoin first came up with, which is proof of work. So anytime you send a message, I didn't talk about this much uh, this time around because it doesn't have much to do with anonymity, but it's still a useful feature. Anytime you send a message in BitMessage, you have to do uh, proof of work for that message. So in other words, you have to uh, cycle your CPU for like four or five minutes. So what that does is if you want to spam everybody on the network, each time you send a message, you have to use five minutes of your computing time. Right? So it puts a cost on sending those messages, which is great because it eliminates. Does that have to be up there? It's just since like 1030 this morning, there were 117 deaths. That by broadcast, that's to everyone on yes. the network open? Correct. Yeah, there's person-to-person -person -person messages and then broadcast messages. There's a lot of newsletters and stuff that have, that have set up on you. It's kind of so like the new newsletter. What's that? So they're already out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, a lot of people are using this as kind of a newsnet, uh, or the new newsnet. Uh, and then 125 public keys, so whenever people publish their, their address, they, they upload their public keys. So 125 people created new public keys on the network. It, it's pretty good debug. It's kind of fun to sit here and watch this thing go. Hmm? It just updated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, some, somebody's sending messages. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, it's pretty simple and straightforward. So you guys can actually download this, run it, and use it, and you have a working... Uh, system that's better than email out of the box. So please play with it, experiment with it, and build on top of it. Uh, the, the key to making this better and more anonymous is to grow the <coughs> amount of people that are using it. Right? So the more people use it, the better it is for everybody. Uh, so the, my, my hope in giving this talk is, is to get some of you interested and involved in this. Uh, some of the things that I think are really great, one, it's, it's Linux focused, so there's a lot of really cool stuff uh, going on in here that, that uh, you can do if you're on Linux versus Windows. Um, it is using Python, so it's very accessible. Uh, it's open source, and it's the code is still simple enough. Uh, don't be scared. The, the code is incredibly rudimentary still that you can dive in and, and have a blast in here. Um, that and it's just plain fun, kind of playing secret agent, right? <laughs> All right, uh, I think that's it for me. Uh, hopefully that leaves a little bit of time for any other questions, and if not, Uh, it's both the client and the server. So you can uh, you can run this with a dash daemon switch, and the, uh, that's described in the daemon documentation, and it will run as a daemon. Or you can run it as a client. Uh, just like Bitcoin, same thing. Bitcoin has, if you run it as a wallet software, you can run it with the GUI, which is what I'm doing here. Or you can run it just as a uh, server. Uh, can, you, can you run the server on read, read, uh, What do you mean in parallel? Yeah, so if you run this as a daemon, it doesn't even start the GUI portion of the code. So none of that runs. It just runs as a so server. I, I, I'm talking about the oh, you want to separate the two? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the way that you would do that, so the, there's no way to connect the GUI to a running uh, server, uh, but there's an API so you can write, write your own GUI. So the reference GUI is... My question is running on the grid. Oh, running on the grid? Yeah. Uh, which grid are you talking about? Like, uh, the carrier instance, and I want to... Oh, yes. yes, so you mean for the proof of work? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, uh, just like with Bitcoin, you can write a miner for this if you want. So I'm sure there's some sp uh, spammers out there already, uh, you know, uh, fabricating their ASIC chips to, uh, to 
make it so they can send out tons and tons of messages. Uh, the cool thing is, uh, again, the message gives you a lot of control. So if you start getting spam from people who have built ASICs for this stuff, you can ratchet up your threshold for how much proof of work is needed in order to receive a message, right? So you get to control how much uh, proof of work needs to be shown before you'll accept the message, if you're getting too much spam. So the network will adjust uh, organically, if you will. Yeah, great question. So every, that, that's the other cool thing about this. Every, every parameter is tunable. And so you can tune it to be exactly how, how you like it. You can either use few resources at the expense of spam, or you can use more resources and reduce the amount of spam you have. Uh, one of the problems is the reason we get stuck with stuff like Google and Gmail is because they pay a lot of the cost for filtering the spam for us. And so we get trapped in that system because you know, we like getting free stuff, but it's never free, right? We're exchanging our personal information for that. And again, that's usually not a big deal, right? Most people say, well, I got nothing to hide. Well, great, neither do I, but the problem is your friend might have something to hide and they need to talk to you. You, you talked about generating a new address every time. Yep. Just help me think through, how, how do people find you if, if you've been corresponding with someone? How, what does that look like or how does that work? Well, if you're already talking to somebody, how hard is it to give them 20 digits? Yeah, okay. How do you start it? So I like your idea where you just append the new address at the bottom you were saying. Oh, yeah, 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 that mechanism for changing your address every time, yeah. yeah. And you could even automate that. So if you write a client, you can write a bit message client that does that automatically. Yeah. And I think, yeah, there's, I think there's uh, support for signatures in here. I haven't messed with that part yet, but you could, you could even probably hack that into just your signature constantly updates. Yeah, a lot of potential here. Great questions. Have you, you started the Uh, let me see if I can. Let me see if I can reload this thing. Anyway, ah. anyway, right there. So that's how I started the communication, right? So if you want to talk to me, just copy this message off the slide and talk to me. You can post it anywhere, right? So I mean, it's just a number. You can uh, have like a meetup point. You can say, hey, look, I'm going to graffiti my message on on this billboard at 7 p.m. or something, right? And you just put it up there, and then boom. So what, you just need to find a way to communicate the, the initial address. Or you can set up something like MailChuck, right, where your initial point of contact is an email address. And then as a hidden X header in the regular email? The, 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 the sky's the limit, right? Like how many ways have people hidden Bitcoin addresses, right? Been, everybody gets very creative about that. that. That's the thing. Like you have control over how secure your address is. Uh, as far as sharing it, though, yeah, it's, it's not quite uh, – so you could, uh, with email we have directories, right? So if you go to Google, you start typing in somebody's email, it auto fills it for you, right? Where is it getting it from? Your address book. Could you build an address book for this? Sure. Yeah, there is, there's an address book in the client. Um, if you go here, see file, yeah, turn of work. Oh yeah, right here, right? So there's my little address book and I have my friend Neil, right? And so I, I don't need to type in his message, I can just say mail Neil. And when I type that in, I'll email Neil. But yeah, the initial setup, you're gonna have, to, there's, there's no way around having that initial, um, you have to broadcast your public key somehow. And the same problem exists with uh, GNU PG, right? You have to get your public key out there in some shape or form. But that, that's a pretty low price. I saw that there were keys being published in the client. Is that actually, that data saved somewhere? In yeah, on, on my computer. Key registry or something? Yeah, on, everybody stores all of that on their oh, machine. Oh, so everyone keeps a copy of the keys yeah. that they're published. The keys are very small, though. You, you would yeah. need a lot. And, and I think there, there's some kind of pruning process, I'm sure. Uh, again, the, the whole goal of this is to never be a burden on a system. So we're not going to get to a point, or at least hopefully we, we never get to a point where uh, BitMessage is uh, destroying your uh, a regular computer. And if there is, there's a way to tune it to make it work on a regular computer. Does that mean if so, if, if it got to a place where every message was, was uh, sending Mm -hmm. And now it's propagated across the whole network. Mm -hmm. that those keys would just grow up, you know, uh, immensely, and you, the streams would have to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Is that that, or, or you can do things like pruning. So I mean, the, the sky's the limit here. We can we can look at it a lot of different ways of solving this. So one one potential way is if we don't see messages going to a particular public key for like let's say thirty days, we just purge them from our cache, right? Mm -hmm. So we control how how the server operates. So if we need to scale down the resources, we can tune that. Uh, to, to, to scale as needed. But it's in, it's in your command. It's not hard-coded in any way. Great, great questions.
hopefully some of you guys, some of these questions, hopefully somebody goes out and actually implements some of this stuff too. I'd, I'd love that. <laughs> cool. Thoughts? What do you, what do you get? Oh, yeah. I was curious, what's your relationship with fitness? <laughs> Um, I, I discovered it a, several years ago. Um, I, I was just, I really, I was really fascinated by the white paper and I, I, I really bemoan the issues that email has. And so when I read the white paper, I was like, oh man, this is it. This is how we solve the email problem. Because nobody's been able to solve how to replace email yet. And I think that this is heading in the right direction. I think this is great as a general purpose tool, not just an anonymity tool. It starts in anonymity because it's so useful for that. But I think this would be a lot better as a general purpose platform than email uh, in the long run. And so that's how I became interested in it and have been kind of working with it. And the more I work with it, the more I, it's exposed me to understanding how distributed networking works, right? And everybody's, that's a hot topic now. So if you're really interested in distributed networking, this is a really good place to start because it's still a young project with a lot of greenfield opportunities. Um, and I think we'll all benefit from this. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, also, uh, if you're interested in hanging out in the community, uh, the uh, anybody on Reddit here? Okay, a couple people wanted to admit it. Um, <laughs> uh, if you go to r uh, slash bitmessage, uh, there's a lot of uh, activity going on there too. Um, so that's a good way to kind of see the ongoings. Cool. Any other thoughts? So I, I just want to throw a kind of more general question out there. Hopefully, we can generate some discussion. Do you guys think we should have? anonymity in, available to the general public. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Is it? Okay, without any judgment, is there anybody that disagrees here? And we welcome disagreement. Okay. <laughs> oh, yep, we got one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so that, that's a great point. So for data, data analysis is not all bad. Right, like when Google parses all of our emails, sometimes it actually gives me useful information. So do we do we want to we, we kind of maybe have to think about that trade off? Uh, do we want to give up all of the conveniences that data analysis gives us? Great point. The the thing that I wrestle with it myself is yes, I'm all in favor of anonymity and privacy, and I really believe in the idea that if we're all doing this, then we are protecting people who are doing courageous things, and I think that's great. But there is this part of me that wrestles with the fact that there are people that are doing nefarious things, and I am not, I, I want to protect their right to, to do nefarious things, but I also want to be able to support our community in protecting ourselves from the nefarious things. So that's, that's the trade off. That, Very much so. And yeah, it's not a black and white question. I mean, it's, it's easy for me to come out here and go anonymity, rah, rah, but there's a lot of things that anonymity. Uh, facilitates that, that's destructive as well as constructive. And so I think it's, it's a conversation that needs to be ongoing all of the time. We, we have to, because it is a sliding scale, and if you take nothing away from this, just t walk away with this. Anonymity, like a lot of things, is on a sliding scale. And we as a society set kind of what is acceptable on that scale, right? For better or worse. And so if we stop having the dialogue, somebody else is going to set that level for us, and we may not agree with, with where we're comfortable with that level of anonymity being. Right? And uh, whenever you hear talk about it, think about, okay, well, is this too much anonymity, or is this not enough? Just another way to think about that is just to flip it with the idea of transparency. And so we often talk about transparency as being a good in the case of things that we want to, you know, government functions or business communications between, you know, Exxon and the government, you know, you want transparency in that rather than anonymity in that. And so once you have tools for anonymity, mm -hmm. they can be used oh, yeah. across the whole spectrum. Oh, exactly. Yeah, I mean, this could be used for, you know, small little uh, rebellion groups that want to change the world for the better. It could be used by corporations to hide uh, the nefarious things that they're doing to, you know, their consumers. Um, I, I mean, it's... It is, it is. And, but this technology is a big part of that discussion. And so I, I think it's, it's worth engaging with it to understand what is possible. And can we even avoid it, right? Is it, is it even avoidable? And if the, the, the other question that comes up, there's an interesting book I read uh, a while back. It's a science fiction book called um, uh, Light of Other Days. Has anybody read it? 
Oh, good. We do have one person. It's a great book. It explores the idea of, and I recommend everybody who's into any kind of technology reads it because it's very, um, it pretends, I think, where we're headed. It, the, the premise of it is that everybody has access to, is able to look in to what anybody else is doing. Right? There's a technology that's developed, and you can see anybody at any time that you choose. Right? You can just bring them up on your screen. Google. Huh? <laughs> Basically, right? Or Facebook or whatever. You, you can, it's the ultimate, uh, what is it? The, uh, Oh, my, my brain's dying. Um, espionage? Not, not espionage. What Social is that? media. No, what, what's that thing where you like watching other people? Voyeurism. Voyeur. It's the ultimate like voyeurism, voyeurist dream, right? You can see what anybody is doing at any time. And the book kind of walks through the implications of that, both good and bad, right? Um, anyway, so I recommend that as a study on it. But what it, it, the discussion that it leads to for me is that um, if people are able to have access to this tool, uh, at a higher level of government, right? If, if there's no way to stop it, or government or any organization, uh, is it right that they have access to anonymity but we do not, right? So if there's no way to stop it, shouldn't we then at least equalize it? So that's another, another thing to kind of think about. Um, or do we just crack down on this and allow certain people to have it and others not to have it, right? But I think this is a discussion that we should be having uh, but it's a difficult one because it's highly technical. So the people in this room, you guys are, you know, you're all kind of on board here. But if I presented this to a general audience, I, you know, I, I don't know how to state the case clearly. And so I'm hoping you guys can help me too with that is we need to state this case to people who are not quite as technical and explain to them there's a lot of power here and we need to decide how that power, or how we deal with that power being in our community. Yes? I think the Yeah. They want to impose like a cost on secrecy, mm -hmm. so that if you know, like a corporation or a government needs to be more secret, it'll be therefore less efficient and more costly. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, corporations or governments that don't have that requirement can be uh, more efficient and hopefully succeed where they really don't. Sure. Yep. That's part of it. But in in doing that, are we also building tools to make it harder for small organizations to be able to keep uh, anonymous discussions to themselves? Right? Like, would we like WikiLeaks as much as if they started ratting out, you know, a bunch of smaller uh, grassroots groups? Like, I mean, the, the, the Hillary Clinton email scandal, right? Even at that level, it, was that fair? I don't know, right? I mean, it, do we want to see everything about our politicians? We probably wouldn't elect anybody <laughs> if we did, right? Everybody's got skeletons. So the question is, how much transparency do we actually want? Um, I, I, don't, I don't have answers here. I'm, I'm just more interested in the technology. <laughs> Something to think about, yep. Well, and maybe it, it sort of shifts the framework in terms of the difference between transparency and communication and, and action, mm -hmm. you know, because there's, there's a difference between saying, you know, I'm going to talk about doing something versus doing something. Um, so if we're thinking about anonymity versus transparency, maybe, maybe they're on two different realms. Like you could have anonymity and communication more transparency in the action that's taken. Yeah, 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 exactly. So we can, we can kind of, we can probably encode those trade-offs into, into our legal system. And so, anyway, uh, everybody's probably getting hungry for lunch. I'll wrap it up here. Thank you guys so much for coming. Please think about these issues. Like BitTorrent, DH, DHT, uh, distributed hash table. Uh, okay. it, it's great stuff. I recommend reading the paper on DHT. It is on DOS. That's, that's like one of those. Like right at the edge, I kind of see how it goes. Yeah. But I need to, I don't if you can, if you can grok DHT, yeah. your your networking world just opens up. It's pretty cool. Awesome. Yep. Very cool. Thank What's you DHT? Uh, distributed hash table. It's how uh, clients find each other in the peer-to-peer -peer system. Yeah. It's been okay. used in everything since like Casa days. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you. This yeah. was great. Oh, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, I don't know what's going on here, but that's that's kind of creepy. The flashing. <laughs> anyway, uh, I guess. Um, I question. So, would I be able to uh, have have a, like, a high level, which is highly anonymous, 
I just have like a really low level, just sort of uh, just like look at a bunch of like geeky names that easily found and just to try the stuff out. And then that, that's what most people are using it for. Like I said, okay. it's like, do you remember Use Usenet? Usenet. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the new Usenet. Okay. And Usenet was really big on uh, anonymity too. Way back in the day, there was some really good uh, sub discussion groups uh, on that. So like this is where a lot of the Usenet geeks are, are heading. Check out also. Uh,